Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's session. Uh, for those of you who don't know, my name is Ben Smith. I am the CEO and co-founder here at TeamGage. Uh, and today, we're very fortunate to have a special guest with us uh, by the name of Jean-Michel Lemieux. Uh, Jean-Michel has worked in tech for 27 years, building software and then building teams and companies. Uh, he's, soft, he's a software developer by background and has built and led teams of one to 3,000 people. Uh, he was a founding member in the Eclipse platform and open source team, and then led engineering at, uh, at Atlassian and Shopify. Uh, Jean-Michel Michel is currently writing Building from the Right Side, a book to help increase technical leadership, creativity, and confidence. Uh, welcome, Jean-Michel. It's great to hear, be here, Ben. Thanks for having me. Not a problem at all. So uh, just a, as a way of an intro for the audience, the, the way we actually connected was uh, something you'd written on uh, Twitter uh, in, in the process of kind of writing your, your current book. And it was around this idea of uh, autonomy versus alignment. Uh, and it was one of those moments that, uh, you know, at least for me, it was a, it was a bit of a, an eye-opening moment where it's everything you wrote made complete sense. But up until this point, you know, it took someone like you to write it in such an eloquent way for the pieces of the puzzle to fit in. Uh, and I guess to summarize what you were talking about there was really this idea that um, we've been told, you know, hire great people and just get out of their way. Um, and that's sort of the conventional, conventional wisdom of how to build great teams. But um, really, without that alignment piece, you've got, you know, everyone in that team then just pu pulling in different directions. So this idea that um, alignment is a critical piece of that puzzle and, and getting the balance right uh, was something that resonated with us and I'm sure will with the audience. But maybe you could start off by um, telling us a little bit about the book that you're writing and, and the unusual way that you're doing it and then how this uh, alignment and autonomy piece fits in with that. Yeah, well, I guess uh, thanks to the internet, we, we met randomly, which seems to be happening more and more uh, these days, which is uh, meeting cool people on the internet. So um, I guess that's how I met you, which is, which is cool. And uh, I think that the backstory or the back backstory to that is, you know, I'm a software developer by trade and, um, you know, realized, you know, halfway through my career that, um, you know, writing software is hard and challenging, uh, but building teams and companies is more challenging. So I, you know, I went on a mission to how, how can I do both? Um, and, you know, over the years realized that I have zero training in the building companies and teams part. And, and I, you know, I spent all this time and we all did, you know, learning some, some profession of some sort, which included such a small part of, of actually the hard part of working with people and, 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 and mixing your, your, whatever your craft is technology with, with people. So, um, uh, I think the, the idea for me after, you know, 27 years and, and stumbling and crawling and having some wins, but a lot of steps backwards was, you know, how, how to share this with, with some people. And um, so again, I, you know, I'm, I'm trying to write about this to share as, as much as I can, because I think there's a lot of us in our, in, in these shoes um, where we're, we're yearning for like knowledge and understanding and a way of seeing things. And um, often a lot of us don't have a lot of mentors to do that. So that's kind of my next phase in my career now is helping people see maybe what, as, as you mentioned, is there, but it's, it's hard to put words towards. Um, and uh, I think the, the, the latest chapter that I wrote was, as you said, it's about autonomy and alignment. And uh, if you don't mind, I'll just give you a bit of a, a background on autonomy, which is fantastic. I think yeah. like everyone listening to this is, is going to say autonomy is like the magic word, right? How many times have we heard people go, just, you know, bottoms up team and let be, people be creative, right? Does, yep. Isn't that like the, the, the fad du jour, right? Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, right. And if, if, you, if you ever like dis autonomy, you will be burned at the stake. Like you'll be like, <laughs> what are you talking about? Like autonomy is the thing. And if you, um, you know, you've probably all heard about Daniel Pink who wrote the book called Drive in which there's a whole section on Atlassian in that book. And he talks about mastery, purpose, and autonomy, like the, the golden three and autonomy again is there. Mm. And I think over my career, what was interesting is, is I realized that autonomy came really naturally to me, you know, and then, and then, but then all the feedback I was getting from my bosses was about JML, like, John Michelle, you're really autonomous, but you know, I think you've got to align with me a bit more. Like they talked about communication. And at some point I was like, I had this realization that one is they were, they were completely correct. It was, it was mostly my problem, but I'd almost felt like I was fulfilling everything that, that I've been taught. And then I, you know, I, 
I kind of sat there for a while and over the years re realized that the reason why autonomy is so sacred is we're trained to be autonomous for our entire lives. Mm. Like think about it, like when you go to school, when we've all gone to school at some point, we're like giving homework and we're like, you're not allowed to cheat. You've yeah. got to do it yourself. Yeah. Right. Um, your parents are like, I can't wait till you leave the house and you're autonomous. Like <laughs> autonomy is, is, is possibly one of like the, the Western, at least the Western values that are, that that's entrenched in us. And we never talk about it. And then we have all these scientists that go study humans and they're like, you know what? Humans really like autonomy. And I'm like, no shit. <laughs> We've been trained to be autonomous beings for our entire lives. And then you're asking humans what they like and they go autonomy. And then I go build companies and I'm like, you know what? Before autonomy happens, we're going to have to, we're going to have to like my, meld our minds together and figure out what we're doing. So it's, it's um, amazing. I think that was that. the realization for me is actually the hardest thing about building companies is actually alignment, which is deciding what are you going to do? How are you going to do it? And then how do you adjust that in real time? Because what we're doing is really hard. And once you have, once you have alignment as a foundation, because, um, uh, one is we've never practiced it. So how, how do you like, we're actually really suck at it because we never practiced. Yeah. Remember I told you we spent our whole time practicing autonomy. So we never practiced. It's what we need. And it's what I had to learn to do the most in, 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 you know, in the two companies that I built almost from the ground up was alignment was the hardest thing for us to get. And autonomy came naturally. And we always spent so much time. So I think that that's the background around, you know, what I'm trying to explain in that story about alignment. And also, I mean, a whole other discussion around people don't know what to align on. So yeah, I think that, yeah. that, that's why that, that, that chapter came to me. It was, um, uh, I, I think possibly one of the most overlooked things, uh, that people, um, are ignoring, I guess, when they're building companies and, and a lot of it is environmental and, and around us, people have been pointing at autonomy and we should be looking at alignment. Yeah. Look, it's, it's amazing. Even the example you gave there of, of the education, uh, piece, uh, you know, and it's a wonder why then you get together and do a group project in university. And that seems to be the absolute worst experience you can have, right? <laughs> as exactly. soon as they try and get people working together, it's, uh, it doesn't come naturally. Uh, so look, I, I think there's, yeah, there's a, this is obviously a really deep uh, topic that we could talk about forever, but let's talk a little bit about the, the a balance between autonomy and alignment then, because I think, um, you know, some people will wear being autonomous as a badge of honor. And I think you even refer to, to that in the, in the um, chapter. Um, and then this idea of, you know, what we align on. So, you know, the conventional wisdom has always been, well, we just get synced up on the why and then, you know, let everyone be autonomous on the how. Um, but that's, that's something that you've seen a little bit differently as well. Yeah. And I think that's, that's kind of the, the follow-up. So once you recognize that um, you need high alignment, before you're allowed to have autonomy, then the next question is, what does high alignment even look like? You know, and I think it's, it's fascinating because alignment um, can't be measured. It can only be discovered. Um, and I think one of the biggest mistakes people make is they align too superficially. And in some ways, you can think of alignment like a, a, a synonym of alignment is strategy. You know, and I'm like, hey, what's our strategy? Like, let's decide what that is. And um, to give you maybe an example of how how broad people can interpret what strategy and alignment looks like is I'll give you a, a simple example, right? Um, so imagine uh, our, our mission is to sail a sailboat from Portugal to the Caribbean or North America, whatever, right? And so one, per, one CEO of that sailing trip's uh, vision of alignment is the following, or strategy and alignment is, listen, our vision is I wanna sail across the ocean, I wanna have fun and I wanna do it fast. Who's on board, let's go right? Yeah. That's, and then that's literally, that's all I have to tell my team and I'm out of here and l let me know when you show up, right? And they're like, I've got high alignment. Everyone's high-fiving each other. We're like, if you give me a, an engagement survey, I'm going high, I'm high, highly aligned. And there's another CEO who's going to go have a different conversation with their team. And they're going to go, listen, um, you know, we do want, we want to sail across the ocean. Absolutely. But let's talk about how we're going to do that. Cause there's a lot of options, you know, and I think, you know, like when are, when are we going to leave? What kind of boat? Do we want a big boat, a small boat? How many people on it? What kind of sail? Do you, like, do, how fast do you want to go? Like, do we want to, do we want to make a stop? Like there's just a lot of conversations. And, and once you realize and you start asking yourselves questions about, about some of the how, so not just the why, but the how, what you realize is some really important decisions there that um, when you dig into them, you realize are fundamentally, you're gonna change how you're gonna do something. 
they're fundamentally like, you know, if you take a catamaran or I'm going to row across, like that's, you have a different purpose. And I think yeah. that that conversation about the how ends up helping you discover what kind, what things you have to be aligned on. And most of the leadership teams, most of the teams that I work with uh, feel that it's a taboo to talk about the how they feel that's, I'm not supposed to, I'm supposed to let my team do that. But just like sailing, we can discuss the how, but I don't have to go on the trip with you. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I can let you go sail, but you know what, as, as, as partners and as working on the same team, I think there's some very important decisions that, that can make or break your sailing trip that um, would change how much things are going to cost, like, like, et cetera. Like, let's have that conversation. And I think what I was trying to get at with the, um, you know, maybe a bit of the sensationalism I put around alignment being important and shining a light is going is, is not having those alignment conversations are actually getting in the way of, of the speed that you have on your team, of your team actually making good decisions. Because at the end of the day, as a leader, your job is to maximize good decision making. <laughs> Yeah. And if, if you're not kind of working on those things together, um, and uh, I think you're going to make bad decisions. So in that sailing example, there's you know, two examples of different kinds of alignment. And I think society as a whole and most business books tell you, like, let your team do the how, like get out of their way. And I think my, my, um, my ask of leaders is there's a way to engage with your teams, get them in um, on, on the how so that you can develop some understanding of what alignment is and because what happens is, is the teams go off and then the, the bosses or the CEOs are like, that's not what I told you to do. Yeah. And I'm like, well, shame on you for not having the conversations in the first place. Like don't blame your team. And, and again, people are afraid of having those chats of, of being labeled as a micromanager mm. when what they actually have to do is let the team go on the trip to, but it's okay to have those conversations and it's okay to have them deeply because that's where you're going to discover some lack of alignment and then you're actually going to finesse what you actually care about and, and as you work through that process. So I, I think that's, um, so if anything, go deep on alignment and then that gives you permission to have autonomy. And, and mm -hmm. I talk about, you know, highly aligned continually yeah. on, on the why and the how, and then autonomous on the implementation which yeah. is, you know, let your team, let your leaders go, go do it. Um, but get, you know, don't, um, don't be afraid of some of the hard, deep conversations in the how um, it's going to save you down the road when some surprises come up, et cetera. And you're going to learn how your team thinks, you know, you're going to learn about, Hey, we have three options here, which like, let, let's discuss which one is best. And I think you get to learn a lot about how people think and, and um, uh, you know, we're, we're, all our companies work in a very complex environment. And I think understanding how your leaders see that complex environment helps you understand, um, you know, how to help them and maybe what biases they're bringing into every decision you're, you're not in the room with. So anyway, that's maybe a long story short about how um, superficially aligning is almost as bad as not aligning. No, look, I think a lot of what you've just said there um, is actually shining a light on major issues that, leaders all over the world are having and and maybe it's actually this you know this this idea of oh i can't get involved in the how that's causing some of this i mean you think about a lot of what you said there around alignment is really thinking about context you know i know something that yep. that senior leaders in particular struggle with is is context of their um direction setting so they can say look you know this is the experience that we want the customer to have and at a high level that makes sense but if you don't have the context of what the interaction with the customer actually looks like, you don't have the how of that information, how can you possibly set a, a good direction? Um, so I think that's, that's something that, that, you know, things just keep falling out of, of this idea um, as, as we go through them. The other, the other thing that struck me is uh, in this idea that almost no decision is, you know, wholly wrapped up in its own um, unique context right every mm -hmm. every decision interconnects with other decisions and other designs and other processes so this idea of you know get together get alignment on the why and the how and then you know almost what i heard you say there is like then there's no surprises down the track we don't sort of pop up the other end and go oh well such and such did this and this other team has gone in this direction and you know how did that happen well it's because you didn't really understand the the alignment in the first place yeah. And, and I, I'd say a lot of teams, as you're right, like um, are afraid of the mess of the problems that we're in, right? Like we're, 
you know, you build a company, you're like, okay, I want a team A is going to do this. Team B is going to do this. Team C is going to do this. And they're going to be in the swim lane and everything's, you know, everything's going to be fine as long as they, you know, they, they do what they said they're going to do. But like the world's way messier than that. Right. So in some way, alignment is a, is a forcing conversation between, you know, these teams or groups where we're kind of all working in the same kind of problem area and, and, and like understanding where those boundaries are, understanding where the gaps are is I think like a big job of leadership, you know? And, and, and I think that's, um, again, there's a taboo of not getting involved, but as you said, understanding where the dependencies are, what the overlap is, and actually just having those chats um, and building a culture of having them being okay. And, and I think that's where you go fast, right? And a lot of times in the alignment chats I'd have, we'd eliminate work. Mm. Like, like, and that's something that actually I, I forgot to mention in, in the book, but, um, you know, if you want to go fast, often the best way to do that is remove things, but, but humans hate removing. It's harder, right? Like try removing yeah. a meeting from your calendar. Like I can't yeah. remove things, but you can add stuff all the time. So yeah, like all of our teams are adding stuff all the time and it's really hard to remove things. And I think alignment forces us to really focus. And what I've seen teams is, is they realize, man, I really might not have to do that. Right. So you gain a lot of velocity by really focusing. Um, and I, I think making decisions to remove things is a risky thing. And when you do it kind of as a team, and I do that a lot with my teams, um, you can normalize, you know, removing things to focus, but to remove something, you, you, you kind of, you have to understand, you know, uh, second order effects, uh, kind of, as you mentioned, right in this messy world, things are complex. You have to understand, um, uh, kind of second order effects and then like what the impact is and, as, and then, and then move on from that. So, um, as you said, I think that's really important to um, kind of build a, and then build a culture of doing that all the time. You know, that it's interesting, you know, it, it's not like you align and you're done. I think what they say is the minute you've had a meeting about alignment and you're out of that meeting, you're misaligned again. So again, build, building a, a culture of doing that um, often is, is important. Yeah. Yeah. I think that um, what you've just said there resonates really strongly as well is, is, you know, obviously we're all unique and we'll, as soon as we leave that meeting, we're all going to have our own interpretation of what happens next or the next problem that crops up. Um, so let, let's talk a little bit about then this idea of the autonomy complex, because I know that there will be team members who, if their team leader just walks in and says, Hey guys, I've, you know, I've heard this amazing talk um, by uh, Jean-Michel and I think, you know, we've got to get aligned and, and, you know, that, as you said, we 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 naturally are sort of uh, educated that autonomy is this holy grail. I think some people will tie autonomy to their self worth, um, and then I think at the, at the, on the flip side, there will be team leaders who will take this the wrong way and assume that this means they can literally go in and micromanage. So, tell us a little bit about how you would implement this idea into the culture of a team in a way that everyone kind of understands, you know, what the balance is and and why it's important. Yeah, it's, I mean, you're on a good point, which is it's, it's a bit of a, we're kind of living on the edge of a knife, right? Where, where um, you can be very bad at alignment, you can completely over align, or you can completely micromanage. And that's, that's why it's hard to do, do it right. Um, I'd say there's a couple of questions that I think teams should be asking themselves continuously. And I think these questions help not measure, but discover alignment. And I'd say for, for team leads, instead of, you know, again, like your job's not to do your team's work, right? But your job is to, is to ask the right question. So here's, I actually just wrote a couple down because I, again, I hadn't. Um, so question number one for a team is like, where are we going and why? You know, and, you know, just the, do you guys know that, right? And have, again, like, has someone written it down? Um, do you have new team members who, who know this, right? Um, what other directions could we be taking and how would we know? Right. So this is, okay, here's where we're going and why cool. What, you know, and, and directions going, like, what are the first five steps that we should be taking? Right. Get the team together. What are they? What other options do we have? Right. So th I think this is a lot, like a lot of this is brainstorming around trying to, trying to like solve this complex problem. So again, where we're going and why, what are the directions could we take? Should we be eliminating any of them? Um, and then the questions are, how do we get there? Right. Um, what's known. Okay. Let's move fast. Like what, what are we really sure of? Okay. Yeah. Let's go. Like, that's where we get autonomy. We're sure about that, yeah. but let's just go build it. Right. Then it's like, yes. you know, um, what, what do we not know that we should move more slowly about who's going to go help us discover something new and come back and, and help us kind of shine a light on this. Um, 
And then the, the next one is, are we looking far enough ahead or not? Right. So those, those are, yeah. for me, those are like the alignment discovery questions that I think the team should be like, and asking themselves. And I think if you use that as a basis of where, of, 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 of those discussions. And also, I mean, the other one is like, how, how do we know if we're moving in the right direction? Like, these are like, give us a demo of what's happening. How do we see this and that? Like, so progress is, is, is the fuel of a team as well. So I think that's, for me though, that's what alignment conversations are. It's not, Hey, can I see what you're building? I want to do it for you. Or it's not a, where things at, right. It's, it's, it's a lot around, um, how do we know what we're doing is good? How do we know that we've explored it enough? And how do we know we're making progress towards that as a team? You know, and yeah. I think if you, if you stick to that, I think that you can have autonomy in that because, because when you have like, let's say you have this discussion once a week for an hour, just one hour a week with those questions. And then you're going to come up with a bunch of unknowns. And you're going to give that to a couple of people to go to explore and come back next week. You're going to, there's a couple of things that are going to be extremely well-defined. You go and you build and you come back. Right. And then, and then you, you refine that process, you know? Um, uh, and I think the other tip that I have um, is there's some managers and some leaders who are, um, who micromanage because they don't have those conversations and they have micromanaging at the wrong level. They're like, when's that going to be done? Is it mm -hmm. done? Is it good? What's right? Because they haven't had, they, they don't know how to have these, these strategic conversations with their team. And then they, they manage in Jira or they manage at the issue or they, you know, manage at midnight on a Tuesday panicking. Right. And I think, um, you know, I, I always think that every manager, if you have that one hour a week with your team brainstorming and your boss asks you about something, you don't have to bug your team because you know what's you kind of know what's going on. You, you know directionality and that's usually what what matters um and again autonomy um you know i, I think there's, there's also too much alignment that can happen mm. which is if, if you're having six hours a week of alignment meetings <laughs> you probably don't have a crisp definition of where you want to go like and right. i i have seen that happen what i've seen with i'd say too much alignment is um like a lack of vision you know yeah. like you know, like I, I'd say asking too many people where to go, but having no kind of um, idea, like whether using your gut or like, and, and um, uh, I think a boss's job is to see when there's too much alignment happening and make a decision, right? Too, too much alignment usually is we can do five things. We don't know. It's like, just like help pick one and help get momentum going. Yep. Um, so I see junior managers uh, over aligning a lot because they, they lack a bit of confidence of picking something. Right. When they're, when their teams may be afraid of and giving them permission to go, actually, what do you guys think? Oh, let's move. You know? And I think alignment sometimes actually is about moving. It's, yeah. it's really not just about conversation all the time. It's about aligning and moving and, and being able to understand when you see stagnation because of a lack of decision-making, you, you have to step in and, and help your team, you know, de-risk and just move. Yeah. Look, I think that's, that's really good advice, particularly for new leaders, because uh, you know, I think we can, we can at times overwhelm new leaders with these concepts of, yep, empower your team. And, you know, you, you come in with this idea of like, okay, all I can do is kind of help them stay together and, and let them make all the calls and be autonomous and empowered and, you know, using them as synonyms almost um, as opposed to sort of saying, no, it, it, it's okay. You have permission as the leader when things, you know, aren't aligned or aren't on course to bring them back on course. Um you know, that, yep. that to me is a, a permission that every leader needs to have. Um, you know, there'll be people that unfortunately don't make good leaders and that's all they'll do. Um, but it, it seems to me almost this missing element of it. Like it's okay to lead, uh, but that doesn't mean that your team isn't involved in that process. Uh, would you agree yeah. with that? Yeah, I, I'd say um, teams yearn for clarity more than autonomy. And I think, um, you know, as a leader, you don't bring clarity, but you create a culture of yearning for clarity. And I think that's what your job is. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, the, the other thing that, that strikes me and what you said there, you know, talking about the autonomy complex, I think it's also something where culturally we have glorified the individual, you know, coming to some victorious moment all by themselves. Um, you know, we think about sporting stars and when they get to the top of their game and it was sort of all them. But the reality is that, if you're working in a team environment, it is the team that achieves the objective in the end of the day. So, you know, this, this idea that I, I'm just going to go over and achieve this all myself and get all the, you know, the glory, that doesn't make sense in a team environment because there's just too many factors that, that go into making the whole thing successful. And a lot of that is the feedback loops. 
you know, it's the same thing when you, you see a startup that goes, I've got this great idea for a product. Um, I'm going to go away in the garage and build it. And then I'm going to put it online and it's going to, you know, people are going to buy it in, in, um, in hordes and droves. And then nobody does. And it's because they haven't spoken to the customer in that process. But I see this, you know, there's a, there's a real parallel there in the teams themselves um, needing to have that continuous feedback to, to get their jobs done as well. Yeah. They, like, so I'll just be super honest. I'm an introvert. Like if I spend eight hours a day with other humans, I will uh, self-destruct. So, <laughs> so naturally I'm actually, you know, autonomy. I like, I actually love autonomy. I love my, you know, my quiet time, but I think the difference with sports and is that like the companies we're building is actually a hundred times more complex than a sports game. Like a sports game is like a finite game that you know how to win. We've micro-optimized all the, you know, all the strategies, but um, I think real life's a lot more complex. So I think as, a, as an introvert, I've also recognized that uh, the problems that I'm trying to solve and the people I'm trying to solve it with is so complex that I've got to come out of my shell <laughs> at least enough, you know, and, and I get a lot of value out of that. But I, you know, what... What I loved about um, being crisp about what alignment means for you is that it meant that the time I spent with my peers and my, you know, my teammates was really productive. And then I could go away and I could write or program or I could read. And like, it just, it almost, it, it gave me the time that I had alone that I needed to be a lot more productive because it felt like the time that I was with my team, we're actually talking about things that mattered, you know? And I think that's, again, like, I, I don't want to come out and I think it's it's important to say that you know, companies and teams are places that introverts can thrive in as well. Um, because like a lot of us are like, it's not like we all have to be extroverts and talk with people all the time, but I think we have to be um, very, uh, you know, clear about um, like what it takes to bring people together and, and what, what to do. And I, for me, at least it's, it's given me a lot of, um, it, it means my autonomous time is actually more productive because I know that we're like, I kind of know what I'm doing. Like there's clarity even in my own time mm. that I find um, that I find really good. So yeah, again, if you're listening to this and you're like, holy, sh like is Jean-Michel telling me to be in meetings all day? I'm not at all. <laughs> I'm saying reduce the amount of meetings you have, make them matter, talk about things that matter. And then I think we can, we can spend the time when we're alone doing things that are, you know, that are pushing us all in the right direction um, uh, really well. So autonomy actually becomes a higher fidelity level of autonomy. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so so I, I, in, in this area of uh, conversation, one of the things that team leaders uh, struggle with a lot is this idea of what do I do with disagreement? Um, obviously that's a, a big part of uh, making decisions and, and moving in certain directions, but uh, what is your advice around dealing with disagreement in the alignment process? Yeah, that, that's a good point. Uh, you're right. I, I didn't, I didn't write about that, but that's an actually uh, a very common question because um, although clarity is great to have, clarity is hard to get because you don't know. I'm like, how clear does this have to be before we, we move? And I think what you're saying is, is clarity is a, uh, there's a range and nuances in what clarity means, and 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 often there's disagreement of what what that is. Like, where do you go? Um, I'd say. Teams who have a good alignment process, um, remember one of my questions are, what other directions can we take and have we explored them? And I think the exploration process actually helps you, like as a team, decide how to explore other directions because conflict is usually about direction, right? I, I think we shouldn't do that. We should do this, right? So it's like, have a culture of exploring what those things are. And sometimes um, conflict will happen because teams or team members, you know, haven't explored enough. You know, like, well, actually, if we did that, let's just imagine we did this. And then step B would be step A. Is that, is that getting us where we're, where we're supposed to do? And then if that fails, right? So as a team, if you haven't, um, you're not open about exploring options and you haven't maybe looked at them, then um, I think as a leader, sometimes it's like a 50-50 coin, you know, coin toss. And I think there it's, it's um, you know, about having enough determination to go, actually, we're going to, I'll just, I'll pick, you know, pick one and tell the team, this is what success looks like. We'll know as a team if this was successful. If it's not, then we'll we'll pick you know Plan B. Mm -hmm. um, but again, I think junior leaders uh, find it really really hard to do that. And I think there's a there's a really good saying which is disagree and commit. And I think mm -hmm. asking your team going, listen, you might disagree with this, but let's commit. We're gonna have to commit to it. Um, and then explain to your team what success of picking that option looks like. And let's keep ourselves accountable for is it doing what we think it's doing. Um, 
and uh, and use that as a I think a tool for for helping with disagreement. Yeah, look, I, I love that saying. Uh, it's something that we talk about a lot with uh, with leaders, and it's 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 such a nuanced thing as well. You know, feeding back to what you said before about uh, cutting work out. You know, this idea of you gotta you gotta explore different options, but at the same time, you can't look at every new shiny thing in in great detail. Um, so it's something that that leaders are always trying to balance up in their minds. Uh, and then this idea around disagree and commit, but but what that actually looks like in practice, because it should be something where you know you're you're measuring uh, the success of what you're doing. But you know, I always like to say it as every person in that team takes the idea on as though it was their own and gives it every opportunity mm-hmm. to succeed. And if it doesn't, it's not an "I told you so" moment. It's not a "you should have picked my way." It's like, ah, oh, damn, I really, you know, uh, it's a shame that we didn't get there. I was really pushing for this to work. Um, so there's so, such a lot of nuance in that disagree and commit where you have to shift your mindset um, because, you know, in order to get the team a step forward, it can't always be about, well, it, it, this was my choice or not. Yeah. And, and um, you know, in, in, in addition to that, I think there's a almost a lost art um, that in the world of Gantt charts and timelines we've forgotten, which is um, a very acceptable way of moving forward is going, why don't we do both? Because I, th- I think conflict often happens in the planning part of, of alignment. It's like, we should do A or B. Is like, and we, we put it on paper. I'm like, why don't we go build A and B right now? Like, why don't we just take three weeks, go build A and B, and we'll learn something. Like, we'll learn something more, right? And, and often conflict happens because f- people feel like there's a decision that has to be made with a lack of information and that they don't have time to get the new information. And at least, you know, in, in engineering and technology, um, uh, you know, I try and find room for us to explore more things because I think that helped us understand more. And I think a lot of people hesitate and everyone feels like we're in their deadlines all the time. And that's true. But honestly, like uh, you learn a lot by, by doing, you know, so I'd say again, maybe delay the decision. <laughs> if there's conflict, delay it until you've done some of it. Hmm. And I think you'll, you'll notice you'll, you'll learn a bit more. Right. And um, so again, that's a, it, it's a lost art. Cause I think we, with the, these timelines that are self-imposed, but, you know, probably pretty stupid in some ways. We've we've um, forced a decision before we're even ready to make it, and you know, there, there's maybe a bit of waste in doing two things. But I tell you what, um, we're probably going to make more progress longer term by doing that more often than than hoping to pick something with a one page PowerPoint presentation or something stupid like that. Yeah, yeah. Now, a big fan of uh, data driven decision making. I think uh, it makes a lot of sense, particularly for big decisions, which are going to take you down you know, a path that's not easily reversed. Uh, that, that to me makes a lot of sense. Uh, I just wanted to come back to uh, something around alignment before. I know you were talking about those questions to ask your team, um, but that not necessarily being kind of a measure. What, what would you say are the measures of alignment um, within a team? Well, I think you can't. Like if you ask the team measure on a scale of one to 10, are you aligned? Like you get random questions. I think I, I think the best way is is to ask your team those questions, right? Individually, like in one on ones. Like, hey, what you know, what what do you think we're doing? What are some of the decisions? Like, I think then you get um, you get that nuance of what alignment is, and that's that's actually what I love doing in my one on ones. Was um, you know, not that I'm quizzing everyone, but I'm always I'm just testing. Like, you know, tell me what kind of decisions are having to make. Do you think we're going in the right direction? Have you you know? So you you can actually measure. Um, alignment in terms of just commitment to the direction as well, right? You talked about disagreement, like, do you think we're going in the right direction? You, you have to pull that out of your team, you know, yes or no. And then um, uh, I love, you know, the other thing, a measure of alignment is to go uh, down different levels of abstraction into the how and going, cool, like, like, what are the next 10 things we're doing? And, you know, what kind of decisions have we, do we have to make across these? you know, and, and do you know why we're doing these things? Like just, you know, just again, like a couple more questions around the how, and then you'll, you'll get an idea, you know, like, for example, I don't know, like in technology or in software, like, Hey, we're, we're rebuilding this app, whatever, you know, like, and you're like, what, you know, what are we doing this month with the months after? And then you ask three people and it's all different. You're like, cool. Okay. We've, you know, we obviously haven't talked about this yet. We're, we're, you know, we're going to have to do that. So I think there's, you know, this is not a, we need 10 hours a week to talk, but I think there's a couple of key questions that um, leaders and even I hate the word leader, just people can talk to each other about, right. And you can yeah. use this at home and your it's make your marriage 20 times better. I guarantee it just by, you know, having a couple more questions. Um, and, uh, and I think you'll, you'll, you'll get a sense of that. 
pretty, yeah. pretty easily. So stay away from the score, ask the questions of, you know, where are you going and how, and what are the next 10 steps and what are some decisions? And then I think you'll see pretty clearly, uh, pretty clearly around your team, you know, if they're seeing things in the right way and an alignment often is discovering what people are seeing on yeah. your team. Yeah. And the so lack of that... alignment is lack of context, like different contexts and different, um, uh, interpretation of that. Right. So that's what you're trying to suss out. Yep. Yeah. It's that qualitative analysis of, uh, you know, what, what are the themes we're constantly hearing? Are they different all the time? You know, those sorts of things. Um, yeah. And it, it's funny. Cause I was, I was, uh, my last job, the CEO of my last job was the founder of the company. I've you know, been there for 20 years and we, you know, come out of a review and, you know, you know, he'd ping me on Slack. Oh, you know, Sean Michelle, that was a great meeting. I feel super aligned. And I talked to the team. I'm like, and I'd ask him a couple of these questions and I was like, Hmm. And I was like, do I, do I tell them we're not aligned <laughs> or does someone else tell them we're not aligned? Like I could just, I could just tell that, you know, you know, the CEO's in the meeting and, and he, you know, he gave his speech, you know, he comes in, he gives a speech and he's like, everyone smiled and they nodded. I can't wait. When's it going to be done? And I go around to the team and I go, what do you, what did you interpret from that? And yep. I, and I think it's almost, I was like this mediator for like founders with their teams and realizing how, um, yeah, like, like how even someone giving the feedback always thinks that they're over aligned, just people nodded and smiled, but because mm. it never asked them any questions and it, who knows what's going on. So that was, I always found that funny. It reminds me of the, uh, you know, Winston Churchill had that whole separate department to tell him how the war was really going. Um, because he wouldn't get a straight answer from uh, a straight from answer from there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, that's interesting. Um, so this might actually be a, a, a good segue onto something else that I know a lot of uh, new leaders in particular uh, can struggle with. So this idea that, um, you know, someone who becomes a bit more senior in a technical role and continues on and sort of has this, this, this um, thought that, well, I've been doing this for so many years, I should be a team manager now. Um, mm. And you've said in the past, um, something to the effect of, you know, becoming a, a, a manager is actually a change in, in job description as opposed to a promotion, um, which I thought was a really interesting way of looking at it. Do you mind uh, diving into that a little bit? Uh, yeah, so I think, um, like we see our careers like a ladder but it's very much more like a jungle gym. And I think understanding when you've, you've been using all these things you learned in school. And at some point, I think becoming a manager is, is literally like, there's this whole degree that none of us got right in this. And, and because we see, we call it the career ladder, we think it's another step, but it's actually, we're jumping into this other part of the jungle gym that we have no training on. So I think, I think if you approach it with that lens, then I think you're a lot more open to, I guess, understanding everything you do have to learn. You know, um, so that that's why I use it. I think it's important to use it with that language. It's not a promotion; it's a career change, mm. because I think you have to prepare for it with that uh, diligence. Um, and I think the next thing that at least hung, you know got me hung up when I was making that transition, and you know maybe it's just me, but um, I never wanted to be a manager because again, I'm I'm a bit of an introvert, and I always thought that to be a manager, I had to be one of the slick back salesmen preaching, and then I. Um, I think someone gifted me the book. It's a Peter Drucker book from, it's probably written in the fifties. And I think on like page, I don't know, 11 or 10, he talks about the fact that he'd studied a lot of leaders and realized the one thing they had in common was not their personality type, right? He had leaders that were introverts, extroverts, a mix of everything. Yeah. But what they did do that was actually shared across all leaders was they gathered information to make decisions, communicated really clearly, and built great teams. And you can do those four things regardless of what personality types you, right? So you can succeed at leadership if you, all you have to do is those four things. Now you can spend your career perfecting those, yeah. but um, you know, it's not about smooth talking. It's not about always having to be positive, right? It's just, um, there's so many different ways that you can lead, but what you, um, and you have a lot of creativity in what kind of leader you have to do. But again, you have to be, um, hungry for information because you have to make decisions and help champion decisions. You have to communicate and you have to build great teams. And so those are the four kind of activities you have to do. And I think for me, what was great is that that new career then was, was how do I do those four things? I've got to build new tools to do those. And um, if you're coming into leadership, um, 
with that mindset, I think, you know, you're, you know, a bit like me, like, you know, you, you do stumble, but if you, you have a bit, you know, you know, feel like a beginner, then you're going to just absorb a lot more things. So that's, that's kind of why I think it's a good mantra to start with. Yeah. Yeah. That's great advice. Um, another thing I know our, uh, uh, startup community audience will be interested in is this idea of you've obviously led, uh, teams and companies that have gone through growth and been at various sizes. And we often hear people talking about like, well, you know, this is how Atlassian does it, or this is how Google does it or, or whatever. But um, what are your thoughts on how particularly technical teams should look at their activities at various stages? You know, if you've, if you've got two people and, and uh, you know, other, another company's got 10,000, it's a very different experience as to what your priorities are. Uh, yeah, it's interesting because I've, I've lived through like multiple phases of it. And it's, um, when I look back, like, I, I, I don't know if there's like a, you know, you have to put yourself into, you know, like at 50 and then at 51, I have to do something different. And I, like, imagine like, you know, especially with the two companies that I grew, like, that's a lot to, to think that I've got to change tactics all the time versus I really focus on what never has to change, regardless of what your team is. Is that, and I think those the four leadership um, kind of focus areas don't change, right? And I think that's as a leader, at least that's what helped me out the most. Now, the way you do those maybe change a bit, right? You've got two thousand people, you're going to have to communicate asynchronously a bit more. You're going to, but you still have to do all those things, right? You still have to, you know, gather information. You still have to align teams. You have to make decisions. You have to build great. Like none of that changes. Um, and I think some of the tools you have to use to do them are going to change a bit, but you're, it's always about the same things. Um, so I think that's like, again, for me is one is for the, if you're in a growing company, like people often say, I hate, you know, when we get big, it's going to be boring. I think it's going to be as boring as you make it. I think if you just, you know, keep using these tools, you end up like literally the job's the same. You just have to do it with more people and, um, you, uh, uh, and, it, you know, obviously aligning a lot of people is a bit more difficult, but if you do it more often, then it gets, it's it, it, it obviously a lot, a lot easier to do. So um, I'd say like tactically, like the couple of things that are maybe, you know, a bit more, a bit different is I'd say if you're in a team that you're not hiring a lot of people, you end up a bit of osmosis and you can read each other's, you know, minds a lot more. And some of the startups I was in is, um, I know we, we work so much together that we just, you know, it's kind of like we were married for 20 years and we just read each other's minds. But I think in a company that's growing, you do have a lot more new people. Um, and I'd always tell people and leaders, I'd say, you know, don't expect anything to change until you hear the thing repeated back to you. You know, so whatever you're trying to do, you're trying to make your company better in this or that or this, like you have to communicate it to a point where it's repeated back to you. And obviously that's easier when you're small, when you're bigger, you have to um, do that a lot more. And I think maybe one thing when you're bigger, um, you have to focus a bit more your communication because everyone's inundated with so much that it's it's tempting to tell everyone about what's every what everything's going on versus the really just you know I'd say as a leader of a big org I would focus on the things like the step changes we had to make as a team um, the things that were going to be really hard like really you know obviously when you're bigger it might be a bit harder to get those over the line um, but other than that I'd say ignore how many people you have and focus more on, on the core things that you're going to have to do for the rest of your life um, as a leader. Yeah, fantastic. Um, well, I'm conscious we're, we're running out of time, but uh, maybe just one last question for you, which is, um, what, do you, what do you, and this is a huge question, but what do you think the future looks like? You know, how, in what ways uh, is technology changing the way that we're leading teams and working together and, and finding that alignment? What do you think are the big uh, changes we're going to see in the next sort of 10 years? Uh, I think there's three changes. So the first one is um, I believe that we don't have a lot of tools to align very well, you know? Um, and I think the, the, the way we communicate and having tools help it, help us do that. I think all of the tools we've built have been tools that help us do the work, like the, the actual like engineering work or whatever, but not like Excel or word, but not the tools to actually align humans. So I think, I think we're going to see, uh, a lot more around that just to, to help us actually on the, on the human side of communication. And, and we've seen what happened with, with echo chambers on the internet. Like, I think, uh, you know, in some ways we're learning how humans communicate. And if, if there's something we have to do to work as a team is we're going to have to, um, 
like finesse that a lot. So I think there, there's a huge opportunity there. Um, I've met a bunch of companies doing cool things there. So that, I think that's category one. Um, I think the second thing is we do have a lot of very difficult things to solve on this planet now. Mm. Um, so I think the opportunity there is we have more complexity to solve, um, but we can tap the brains of anyone in the world with people, you know, almost working from home now. So just, I think that there'll be a, a lot of things we don't know around is what kind of tools do we need to help literally tap the brains anywhere in the world, right? I'm talking to you, you're in Australia, you're in Australia, I'm in, you know, in Canada, we've never even met and, and we've already had a bunch of conversations. So how do we, how do we harness that, um, and actually solve some hard problems, right. In healthcare and energy and uh, like all that, like, I think we have a lot of hard problems to solve now that, you know, you could argue that we've been doing some easy things the last 20 years that we've been, you know, learning to, to, to play with this, this new computer chips that we've been inventing. So I think that's, um, uh, that's the second one that's going to be important. Um, and I think the third one is, in some ways, because of the global nature of, of the ability of using the internet, I think getting to onboard people into understanding where you're going is going to be really important. Like there's a power of having people do, you know, micro jobs and, and help you out. I, I find, and this is maybe my personal, I find it like joining a company and making that long-term commitment. Like it's, it's quite a process versus imagining if you could have, you know, flex up and down 30 people to help you do certain things. But to do that, you have to really almost accelerate the alignment process, right? You know, like, how can I bring some people in, help me get somewhere? Like, like imagine if I could go work with you for two weeks, mm. right? You can't do it. Yeah. Do, I, do I have to sign an employment contract? Do I get, how do I get money to do that? I was like, why don't we do that more often, right? Like academia does that a lot. I, I, yeah. I don't think we figured out how to do that in business yet. Like write a paper together, but it doesn't mean we're in the same university. Like we, there's a lot more cross company uh, collaboration in, in academia, which I find has been, has been actually... I mean, look at every big invention. It's all been like multi-university, but companies never do that. And it's always boggled. So I think, I think there's some opportunities now to make companies less black box and actually connect some of the brains we have given the complexity of the problem. And I think that the tooling we're going to build is going to help do that. Love it. So that's uh, my fantastic. quick crystal ball of what the next 20 years might, <laughs> might, might feel like. Yeah, no, that's, years. that's really insightful. I think you've, you made some really great points there, particularly around collaboration. I think, you know, we have, more opportunity to do that than ever before, but um, getting it right is the uh, is the key challenge, and making it fit with uh, you know the systems that work for everyone is is going to be a, a key challenge as well. Well, uh, look, thank you very much for your time today. I uh, really appreciate your insights. Uh, you know, as I said, you're, you're very kind to uh, to jump on after we uh, we connected uh, online, and I think our audience, you know, is going to take a lot away from today. So, um, you know, for all of you who are watching today, appreciate your time as well. Um, if you've got any questions for John Michelle, I assume they can just uh, hit you up on Twitter. They can find me on Twitter. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Just... And the um, the website for the uh, the book in progress is buildrightside.com. I um, encourage you to all go and check that out. Um, and uh, that'll also keep uh, John Michelle honest on continuing the uh, next chapters. So <laughs> we're all, uh, we're all waited, waiting there uh, with bated breath on those. But thank you again for your time and uh, really appreciate it. And, um, and all the best. Thank you.